On June 2nd and 3rd, 2011, the Center for Design and Geopolitics held its first annual conference in La Jolla at Cal IT2, the California Institute of Telecommunications and Information Technology, on the campus of the University of California at San Diego. On design and post-humanism, post and I think that the part of what Larry was talking about in the morning panel about um, the role of the, the type of conceptual design that, that many of us do here as a kind of itself an adaptation strategy at the, at, the, at the time scale of a century or many centuries will be uh, well on display uh, in, in this next panel. The, you know, one of the, this term that's come up it's several times of the Anthropocene, <clears throat> to survive the Anthropocene, we may uh, have to let go of some deeply held understandings of humanity's place in the world. It may not be that the human civilization as that we currently understand it, um, define it, and configure it um, can somehow design or engineer itself out of its predicament without itself being one of the things that it, in one way or another, evacuates. Uh, another Copernican revolution, or perhaps another Reticus. Reticus is an interesting character. Copernicus's main student, um, a cartographer who is responsible for more than anyone for actually convincing people that Copernicus was right. Um, another, another Copernican revolution, in this case one that further decenters not just the earth, but decenters the human from the center of the stage may in fact be the basis of the design program that we require. Um, Frederick Jameson famously uh, argued that the character and content and quality of any utopia is that of a totality. Utopia are totalities, islands, and so forth. But the design of totalities has, in its, as, as Naomi re reference, have history of which is considerably bloody. Today, one of the totalities we are in the process of perhaps unwinding in different ways is that of the, the human and the human society, the anthropocentric forms, definitions of civilization that we've arrived at. Um, and that it, what may secede it is a series, another ecologies of take your, take, take your pick of post-humans, trans-humans, or simply non-humans, animals, vegetables, and minerals. After, um, at the talk that Ed Keller, our first speaker, organized a couple weeks ago on transhumanism, I made some remarks on a similar topic, which I'll, I'll conclude with before handing it off to him. And that is, at the, at the volcano at Pompeii, we all know the volcano at Pompeii, archaeologists in the 1860s discovered cavities in the ancient rock, human-shaped voids in the filled earth empty spaces in the rock that were shaped like bodies. But only later did they fill these voids with plaster to produce the forms of the bodies that disappeared there, those that we're all familiar with. And I think in many ways this is the design space of the post-Anthropocene, to design around the void left by the evacuation of the human diagrams. But humans themselves, you and I, are not just diagrams, we are also archives. We are gatherings of the evolutionary diagrams of forces, of bio, socio, technical assemblages that have installed us at this precarious geopolitical arc. The situation has activated, that situation has activated the archive that is the human in such a way that we have consumed, as Larry drew out for us, as fossil fuel, that is, as peat, the entire archive of pre Cambrian life in the blink of an eye, one century. And this is then the crisis of the Anthropocene. Archives, cannibalizing archives. So like at Pompeii, in that case volcanic ash, that which destroys a civilization is also that which gives that civilization form for subsequent curious descendants, even as a kind of negative shadow. So in our case, it's the convergence of technologies set on the evacuation of the human diagram, what some call the singularity, 
after our, one of our speakers, Werner Vinge's uh, description. That which provides for the durable after image of the human diagram. And is that then, the question then, is that then how to designate the post-Anthropocene, the geologic era after both humans and humanism? So our first speaker, um, one of my very dearest and best friends, is Ed Keller, who I first met several years ago while teaching at SciArc. Ed has taught there. He was the founder of the Mediascapes program, but also um, one of the key figures in the heyday of, of the of, Colum of, uh, of Columbia in the 90s, where he taught a number of, of famous studios on the convergences of film and architecture um, and, another, and other forms of proto-geopolitics. -geo um, he's the founder of a, of a center in formation at Parsons called the Center for Existential Risk, which is part of a consortium of like-minded centers of which the Center of Design and Geopolitics is, is one. He was one of the co-organizers of a couple of the best conferences I've had a chance to speak at recently, one on the Reza Nagarastani novel, Cyclonopedia, another on called hum Humanity Plus. Um, we've also written a piece together, which will be coming out later this year. Ed is uh, uh, many things, a designer, professor, writer, musician, artist. He's currently the, also the Associate Dean of Distributed Learning and Technology at Parsons New School. Um, associate professor at Parsons in the Design Strategy Program, um, and co-founder with, with, with Carla uh, uh, AUM Studio, an award-winning architecture and new media firm, produced residential projects, competitions, and installations throughout Europe and the US. So it's my real pleasure to introduce my dear friend, Ed Keller. Okay. So thank you very much to UCSD and the DGP uh, for the event. It's really been an incredible day and a half so far. Uh, many thanks to Ben Bratton for organizing the event itself. And on a personal note, uh, many thanks to Ben for providing constant inspiration for me over the past decade with his exceptional work and the generous collaborations that we've conducted. Also want to thank Carla Leitao and Ben because parts of this text were written with them. Uh, I think the Center for Design and Geopolitics here is a really exciting project, so I'm uh, keenly anticipating future collaborations at every scale. I'm going to say a few words about our ability to identify the limits of the body and of the human. I'm going to invoke concepts like xenobiology, alternate models of individuality and in science fiction from Solaris, J.G. Ballard's work, to discuss shadow biospheres and the quasi-human. So myself, I'm a designer, I'm an architecture and film theorist, I'm a sci-fi buff, I'm an armchair speculator on post-humans and aliens. I'm a non-expert getting into territory that many here are, are real experts in, but let's see what happens. And this talk today is um, a hybrid beast itself. It's been rehearsed in previous lectures between, well, 2007, really, and today. So let me begin with two quotes. Man is a rope stretched between the animal and the superman, a rope over an abyss, from Thus Spake Zarathustra. And Man is only a roundabout, subsidiary response to the problem of growth. Doubtless through labor and technique, he has made possible an extension of growth beyond the given limits. But just as the herbivore relative to the plant and the carnivore relative to the herbivore is a luxury, man is the most suited of all living beings to consume intensely, sumptuously, the excess energy offered up by the pressure of life to the conflagrations befitting the solar origins of its movement. So what is at stake in a total rethinking of not only the bounds of human life, but the definition of life itself? Is there a dark ecology already present on Earth, which is not only evidence of multiple paths of evolution in our own corner of the galaxy, but which can also provide models for us to reimagine the limits of organic life in material systems and also across multiple time spans? Primo Levi says, we are alone. If we have interlocutors, they are so far away that barring unforeseeable turns of events, we shall never talk to them. In spite of this, some years ago, we sent them a pathetic message. Every year that passes leaves us more alone. Not only are we not the center of the universe, but the universe is not made for human beings. It is hostile, violent, and alien. In the sky, there are no Elysian fields, only matter and light, distorted, compressed, dilated, and rarefied to a degree that eludes our senses and our language. 
Well, if the last panel was depressing, I don't know where you're going to go with that. Cormac mm -hmm. McCarthy begins Blood Meridian like this. The boy crouches by the fire and watches him. Night of your birth, 33. The Leonids, they were called. God, how the stars did fall. I looked for blackness, holes in the heavens. McCarthy looks to the sky in this passage, but the book is relentlessly grounded in the earth, in blood, and murder. A beautiful paean to the savage practice. Alienness could be as much on earth as it is in heaven. All of this makes me think of great B-movies like Event Horizon, a film about the places where time and space break down, a sci-fi horror exploration of contingency, a spaceship which voyages into pure chaos and brings it back. This illustrates what might be at risk when we get exposed to radically non-human systems. What is the alien really, and what does it mean to speak with it? Communication, translation, noise, agency, and thought itself all have an indirect but crucial relation to the concept of the alien, which by definition seems to be something that exists outside of language or measure. This quote from Nietzsche's Birth of Tragedy gives context. At bottom, the aesthetic phenomenon is simple. One need only have the ability to see continually a living play and to live perpetually surrounded by hosts of spirits and one is a poet. One need only feel the drive to alter oneself and to speak out of alien bodies and souls and one is a dramatist. Dionysian excitation is capable of communicating to a whole multitude this artistic power. To feel oneself surrounded by such a host of spirits with whom one knows oneself to be inwardly one. This process of the tragic chorus is the originary dramatic phenomenon. Seeing oneself altered before one's very eyes and now acting as though one had really entered into another body, another character. Here already the individual gives itself up by entering into an alien nature. And what is more, this phenomenon arises epidemically. A whole crowd feels itself enchanted in this way. So I'm interested in this idea of the host of spirits and the consciousness that arises when an individual becomes aware that they are part of a multifarious body. Giorgio Agamben suggests that the gesture opens the sphere of ethos as the more proper sphere of that which is human. And communication is a communication of a communicability. So any language according to this is more important in how it can show an intent on the part of the voices, the transmitters and the receivers, than in how faithfully it can communicate a message. This concept of gesture can be extended beyond just human movements. The exchange of information between aliens allows both parties to discover themselves connected to an interruption of signal, a noise, it's the outside, the open, the unknown, the parasite, and danger. This idea of danger, scaled up to a geopolitical, a transhistorical, a cosmic level, brings us to the figure of the human and the post-human. So as Foucault said in a radio lecture delivered in 1966, my body, in fact, is always elsewhere. It is tied to all the elsewheres of the world. And to tell the truth, it is elsewhere than in the world because it is around it that things are arranged. It is in relation to it, and in relation to it as if in relation to a sovereign, that there is a below, an above, a right, a left, a forward, and a backward, a near and a far. It is at the heart of the world, this small utopian kernel from which I dream. I speak, I proceed, I imagine. I perceive things in their place, and I negate them also by the indefinite power of the utopias I imagine. My body is like the city of the sun. It has no place, but it is from it that all possible places, real or utopian, emerge and radiate. That was 1966, but nearly a century earlier in 1872, in Erewhon, Samuel, Samuel Butler wrote, Man is such a hive and swarm of parasites that it is doubtful whether his body is not more theirs than his, and whether he is anything but another kind of ant heap after all. May not man himself become another sort of parasite upon the machines, an affectionate machine tickling aphid. So da Vinci's image of the Vitruvian man is a body that's seen, it's geometrized, it's measured. It positions the human body as a proportional model for thought, for all our design work, even for the universe, a lens by which to analyze and comprehend the cosmos. Of course, that reading of da Vinci's image has always been challenged. From Rabelais' extraordinary writing in Pantagruel, and these images attributed to Francois Dupre in 1565, uh, to contemporary science fiction and films like Andromeda Strain, 1971, Wise, Splice, Natalini, 2009, Rene Dalder's work in his film Habitat, which I think was 1997. 
In these, we know bodies through their capacity as agents that are formed by and participating in complex networks. Our concept of the human body as a discrete entity with knowable and obvious boundaries has shifted into a more nuanced, complex image, interwoven with threads of context, the ecological, political, geographical, that echo our evolved systems defined notions of other phenomena. Error has turned humans, excuse me, error has turned animals into men. Might truth be capable of turning man into an animal again? Nietzsche again from human all to human. In a text written in response to a challenge, um, I believe the title of which was, what, was what, will be, what will make the biggest difference? Um, Paul Ewald, professor of biology at Amherst College wrote, about a decade ago, one member of a Stanford team scraped spots on two teeth of another team member and amplified the DNA. They found sequences that were sufficiently unique to represent more than 30 new species. The medical consequences of this are profound, as he continues, not only may thousands of viruses need to be tested to find one correlated with a chronic disease, but even then, it may be one of perhaps many different infectious causes. And indeed, in a paper titled Xenobiology, a new form of life is the ultimate biosafety tool. Marcus Schmidt observes that, quote, synthetic biologists try to engineer useful biological systems that do not exist in nature. To design an orthogonal chromosome different from DNA and RNA, termed XNA for xenonucleic acids, a novel information storing biopolymer invisible to natural biological systems. So orthogonal life could create a shadow biosphere that's not in competition for resources with our biosphere. But ordinary DNA and synthetic chemically unique XNA might interact through epigenetic fields. So for safety reasons, Schmidt argues optimistically that um, that possibility should be engineered out. But isn't there already orthogonal life teeming across an epigenetic landscape? Recent discoveries indicate that colonizing bacteria influence mammalian brain development and adult behavior by regulating serotonin and dopamine as well as synapse function. This profoundly impacts learning, memory, motor control. Clearly, we need new models of the boundaries of the human. Both the body and the mind are already apparently swarms unto themselves and at play in the fields of the metaswarm. So is the locus of mind in the human body? Indeed, is it even in humans? In his text, Theriomorphus, Giorgio Agamben notes that in the Ambrosian Library in Milan, there is a Hebrew Bible from the 13th century that contains precious miniatures. He continues, the scene that interests us in particular here is the last in every sense, since it concludes the Codex as well as the history of humanity. It represents the messianic banquet of the righteous on the last day. Under the shade of paradisi paradisiacal trees and cheered by the music of two players, the righteous with crowned heads sit at a richly laid table. What is surprising, however, is one detail we have not yet mentioned. Beneath the crowns, the miniaturist has represented the righteous not with human faces, but with unmistakably animal heads. The political implications of this merging of human with non-human reappears in Agamben's text, The Open, where he observes, Indeed, one of the central issues of Kozhev's lectures on Hegel, which George Bataille attended at the École des Hautes Etudes, was the problem of the end of history and the figure that man and nature would assume in the post-historical world. When the patient process of work and negation by means of which the animal of the species Homo sapiens had become human reached completion. In one of his characteristic gestures, Kozhev dedicates to this problem only a footnote in the 1938-39 course. Kozhev says, the disappearance of man at the end of history is not a cosmic catastrophe. The natural world remains what it has been from all eternity, and it is not a biological catastrophe either. Man remains alive as animal in harmony with nature or given being. What disappears is man properly so called. But in the following passage from Leibniz's monadology, another idea of mind and humanity can be intuited, one which doesn't set the human and the animal in opposition, but finds layers of life nested like matryoshka dolls. Leibniz says, each portion of matter is not only infinitely divisible as the ancients observed, but is also actually subdivided without end, each part into further parts of which each has some motion of its own. Otherwise, it would be impossible for each portion of matter to express the whole universe. Whence it appears that in the smallest particle of matter there is a world of creatures, living beings, animals, entelechies, souls. Each portion of matter may be conceived as like a garden full of plants and like a pond full of fishes. 
but each branch of every plant, each member of every animal, each drop of its liquid parts is also some such garden or pond. So the concept of the parasite, as the French philosopher Michel Serre employs it, might be a, a more useful framework to think the human than the term posthuman. The parasite, a site next to a site, might index bodies next to, inside, and around one's own, alien as well as human bodies, that host of spirits one might enter into. Michel Serre refigures the organism as body in noise, in the thermal howl of negative entropy, as a bundle of perceptions, a fantastic sheaf of times. The organism itself becomes a parasite of noise. Michel Serre says, we have discovered the place, the operation, and the theorem where and with which the knots of the bouquet of time are tied. It is here and in this manner that time flows back and can change direction. It forms a turbulence where opposing times converge. Organization, per se, is system and homeoresis functions precisely as a converter of time. So drawing on this, I reject a simple and linear historical teleological idea of time as a model for the emergence of the post-human. Serre's image of a body crisscrossed by many scales of time, some reversible, some irreversible, better figures the post or the para-human. So what could some of the technical, technological thresholds associated with this multiplicitous body be? Just as a side note, uh, it's incredible for me to participate in this panel because Werner's novel, Rainbow's End, is a book I've been assigning in my seminars for the past four or five years. And I, it's ridiculous that I'm trying to speak about these issues because Werner has thought them through so deeply. But I'm going to try. So massive addressability. I'm going to focus on this concept briefly. It's one among many emerging instrumentalities, uh, epigenetics, extended phenotypes, problems of encryption, biopower, bare life, the open, swarms, post-monetary economies, the open source as a global landscape, geotagging, and so forth. So what's massive addressability? It's a defining characteristic of our rapidly accelerating global network of connections. It emerges when cities, buildings, materials, objects, creatures, sites, books, words, molecules, all act as agents in a reciprocal ontology of things that can find each other. Um, and just briefly on this image of a military operation, the Panama Canal, you could imagine as a kind of spine, using Bruce Sterling's concept of the space-time object, which I'll, I'll mention a, a little bit later. It's, it's really the use value, all of the value of the object is not in the object itself or its production. It's all the data that hovers around it and the relations that that object affords. And so the Panama Canal, obviously, is a planetary scale spine. So when massive addressability reaches across all terrestrial systems, the consequences for design are fascinating. Not only can we map every tree in a city, as, as Benjamin, I believe, was pointing out earlier, every part in a car, but they begin to speak to each other. The relative muteness of matter begins to shimmer and unravel in a kind of haze of information. What defines optimization in a system with hyper-complex feedback loops like this? And increasingly, local organisms, objects, and systems communicate with global partners. The older model of organ transplants is completely being rewritten as people donate now their gut flora to each other. Uh, fact, medical fact. And as an aside, I'm wondering how this is going to impact the whole cryogenic project. I mean, freezing the person or their head, you have to get their gut flora as well. So resurrection is uh, clearly going to have to include one's microbiome. So what's the ontological status of a body or an entity, and how does this change when it's defined by multiple entry and connective points. The network of things is based on and generates further ultra-locality and remote connection. Uh, it's come up already. IPv6, the internet address space, has 2 to the 128th addresses in its field of potential. Uh, that is about 5 times 10 to the 28th addresses for each person alive today. And uh, as I mentioned, Bruce Sterling has unpacked some of the consequences of this addressability in his concepts of the spime and the biot, the spime, a space-time object whose use value is really the cloud of data surrounding it, the biot, an entity which is both object and person. So the sense that's thus built into each body, actor, and situation works to develop an ontology, the rules for classifying and remixing the substance of the world. One is reminded of Thomas Pynchon's crying of Lot 49 and his meditations on entropy and the deliverability of messages. That entire book is a hidden play, unpacking the battle between systems which deliver messages reliably and systems which hijack messages, entropic and negentropic forces. What would a world, a reality, be like if every component in that world was reliably named, findable, and intelligent enough to reach out and find other components? So the great problem we face today as designers and thinkers 
is the mapping of ever more complex hidden systems of order, crypto form, if you will. That long standing project to distinguish between explicit and implicit order and make a claim for one's work based on that articulation. This is what is at stake for biopolitics, governance, individual and collective sovereignty, consciousness and survival. Those are at stake in a world that's rife with superimposition. Viruses living in us, waves passing through populations, cultures thriving within new technologies, new technologies driving general economies. A global surveillance mechanism that tracks each individual's DNA and actions is all too likely, and indeed, such a disciplinary prophylactic healthcare regime may be the only way we will survive. I'm thinking here of Michael Winterbottom's film Code 46, and of course, Werner, Werner Vinge's novel Rainbow's End. They've both investigated the kind of techno-geopolitics of such a surveillance state. Crowdsourcing, decryption, cryptovirology, each impact our collective horizon in unprecedented ways. In a recent conference in New York, the philosopher and AI scientist Ben Gertzel asked, what kind of world is needed to generate mind, or what kind of mind is necessary to generate world? Solaris, in both novel and film versions, provides some clues as we consider the instrumental range of massively addressable systems, whether they exist in technological substrates, biological systems, or exist as complex forms of matter itself. And I quote from Lem's novel, it would only be natural clearly to suppose that the symmetriad is a computer of the living ocean performing calculations for a purpose that we are not able to grasp. The hypothesis was a tempting one, but it proved impossible to sustain the concept that the living ocean examined problems of matter, the cosmos and existence through the medium of titanic eruptions in which every particle had an indispensable function as a controlled element in an analytical system of infinite purity. So in all three versions of Solaris, the novel and the two film adaptations, human boundaries are recapitulated from the perspective of cosmic force or time. And in each case, the problem of responsibility is foregrounded to other groups of humans, to single individuals, and to non-human systems. Indeed, Solaris is a precursor of the idea of the flat ontology, which Manuel de Landa describes as, quote, interacting parts and emergent wholes made exclusively of unique sing singular individuals differing in spatiotemporal scale, but not in ontological status. And there's a, a sharp distinction in attitude between the three renderings of, of Solaris. In Lem's novel and Tarkovsky's film, though we're nearly certain that humans managed to communicate with the ocean, planet, nonetheless at the end of the main narrative, the characters are left stranded, and we can't know if they'll ever survive or ever communicate again with the alien. But as the exception, Soderbergh's film ends with the human not only in communication with his alien, possibly resurrected wife, but assured by her that all is forgiven, implying that deep in the electrohydrodynamic folds of the body of Solaris, redemption can be found. It's a search to heal the webs of time where they have been broken. To quote Chris Marker, another filmmaker concerned with forms of time, now, in close-up, this works, the two parahumans in embrace, but Doc Bailey's stunning final images of Solaris provide persuasive evidence of a profoundly monadic entity, a long shot leaving us in beautiful hovering doubt. Perhaps the most likely explanation, humans have been absorbed into a weakly godlike computational substrate capable of simulating the totality of human life. If a human tried to communicate with the infinitely alien, a consciousness the size and age of a planet, how could any reciprocity be possible? Of course, Solaris is an allegory as much as a space drama. The ocean, which each version tests uniquely, is an earthly and psychic landscape also. It asks us to look at our own ocean, our planet, our magnetosphere, our minds. They're also finding Solaris. And although something like this reciprocity and responsibility is implicit in Kubrick's 2001, which ends with the star child facing Earth. Yet reading Clark's novel, we realize that Clark imagined the alien civilization as so vastly beyond human comprehension that no real relationship would be yet possible. So a question remains in conclusion. Whether interiority and exteriority can ever truly trade messages through this kind of gauntlet of noise can a body, a monad, a parasite ever connect to systems outside itself? 
And I think here again of Pynchon's Crying of Lot 49 or The Invention of Morel by B.I. Casares, two fantastic novels about the interiority of being a human and the possibility of agency or free will in the world, not only in the world, but in the universe that we exist in. And if a body is immersed in an already given situation, can that body somehow bootstrap into a different world, into the yet to come? Giorgio Agamben locates an ethical challenge in the politically agency we have or which we lose in massively addressable systems deployed as forms of governance. Agamben says, thought is form of life, life that cannot be segregated from its form. And anywhere the intimacy of this inseparable life appears in the materiality of corporeal processes and of habitual ways of life, no less than in theory, there and only there is thought. And it is this thought, this form of life, that must become the guiding concept and the unitary center of the coming politics. So what is thought? Thought takes place when systems become aware that they're formed by and communicating with agents that can only provisionally speak their language. This goes back to the idea of gesture that I brought up earlier from Agamben. A gesture is not a complete language. It's a communication of a communicability. And Agamben unpacks that in relationship to a great essay by Walter Benjamin, The Task of the Translator, which Benjamin finishes by saying, essentially, the ethical problem of language and of God, essentially, is that human ethics should be constituted around the incapability of translating the language of God. Uh, that that's a, a kind of a necessary way of thinking about infinite translatability. So thought, the desire to communicate being set in motion through this communication, the gesture of a communicability. So only when we intend to communicate knowing it's impossible and knowing that noise could interrupt, only then is thought more than repetition. And the ethical frame here is one that insists that all the details of our lives must be seen as inextricably connected to the value of life, the form of life. What Agamben calls naked life is life only understood against the horizon of living and dying. But form of life includes myriad registers and flows of information and values life by them, a kind of parahumanist cloud of data, if you will. We could refer here to Solaris again in 2001. We could also refer to Apocalypse Now. The journey taken in Apocalypse Now is an upriver journey, much more savage but no less alien. It's an anabasis to invoke sentient Peirce's extraordinary poem. So to conclude, I'd like to use this term anabasis as a way to rethink the site and process of mind. Earlier I quoted a passage from Leibniz that suggested there might be many layers to both life and mind. I end by echoing that observation through the lens of anabasis, the anabatic process moving against downstream flow. If we accept that the mind might indeed be somewhere else than the head, at least sometimes, then we might search for it in all the scales of the world where anabatic and catabatic processes meet and exchange their complex signals, messages, and noise. And in this model, the acephalous body would be a prima materia, all heads and no heads simultaneously. To borrow a phrase that appears in connection to Donna Haraway, who argues that worlding is at stake in her work on companion species, perhaps we have never been human. And what's at stake in this would be something more than the preservation of a form. It would be the opening of a form of life, to borrow that term from Agamben once more, onto regimes of space-time which might support very little of what we recognize as life. And perhaps we can evolve a vocabulary of gestures to join somehow that host of spirits. Thanks.